Um, so yes, as Malcolm mentioned, uh, um, I'll just give you a bit of background to me and why I've um, chosen to look at this. Um, so um, I am an undergraduate historian, so history, keen interest of mine. Um, but I was also um, a, a, one of the vice presidents of the Guild of Students, uh, a sabbatical officer, so I worked full time um, and have generally been quite involved in the sort of the political spectrum, um, uh, the student political spectrum while at university. Um, as a result of that, I've sort of grown to understand um, quite a bit about the, um, the, the student movement and the student protest movement within that. And um, a lot of the tactics that were utilised in 1968 are repeated today in the context of the, um, the tuition fees debate. Um, and what my, my, my interest was sort of focused around um, whether the successes or failures of today can be compared to the successes or failures of 1968. Um, one key thing to note, I suppose, uh, before I begin, is that in 1968, um, the one thing that has never been matched today is the sheer scale of the of the protests, um, because they were truly, truly impressive. And I've got some images that will just demonstrate how in <laughs> impressive uh, the protests were. Um, so yes, this is um, sort of the findings of my dissertation, um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background to um, uh, to what actually happened in 1968 for anyone who. Um, is unaware. Um, so there are two key things really. Um, the first thing, and the thing that is perhaps the most dramatic element, um, is there was an occupation uh, of the Great Hall um, of this university. Um, that took place in the end of November 1968, and an occupation may not sound particularly impressive, but this occupation went on for eight days and involved, um, there were 2,000, the, the, the occupation peaked at 2,000 students being involved in the occupation. The Great Hall was truly filled to capacity. Um, and there were a total of 4,000 students involved in the debate, involved in the meetings and involved in the occupation um, at the time. Um, just to give that some context, just to sort of demonstrate how significant that is. At the time, so the university at the moment has 26,500 students. At the time, in 1968, there were 6,500 students. So over 65% of the student body were involved in this event in one way or another, which is truly remarkable and has never been repeated since. Um, I just want to jump back very quickly to something that Malcolm mentioned earlier about um, people and structures being inseparable. And I think that's quite a, a, a very true point. Um, so I'm very much focusing on the people, I'm very much focusing on the students in this presentation. Um, but it is quite important to note that um, the, the, the building that was chosen was the Great Hall. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, obviously, the Great Hall is a very much the centre of the university. If you consider that in 1968, the university was a much smaller place, the campus was a much smaller. Um, this was a central element of the, of the campus. Um, beyond that, it was also a close proximity to the offices of the Vice-Chancellor and the Senior University Administration. And since these were the people who were trying to be influenced, um, it was, uh, that's why that place was chosen. So this occupation that took place was um, it was centred around student representation in itself. So this was a group of students, a huge group of students, who were trying to, uh, who were representing themselves through direct action, but they were trying to seek further representation. So the second event that, that, that took place in 1968 was the publication of a document titled The Student Role. Um, the Student Role, as the name suggests, looked at the role of students within universities. Um, they were not, they argued that students were not just attendees at the university, they were not just learners, but they were a crucial element and they deserved to be represented and to have a voice in the way that institution was governed. Um, I'll talk a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail later on about how this was received by the university. Um, but yeah, um, the, the student role was published and uh, the occupation grew from that as a result of the, university, uh, the university's reaction to it. Um, just to uh, touch on something that Eric Ives, who was a, a professor at this university, uh, a pro vice chancellor in fact, um, and he wrote uh, a book on the history of the institution uh, titled The First Civic University. Um, he also published a paper on um, university histories more broadly and he, he mentioned that um, universities are organisms and they must be considered as such. Um, by this he meant that you cannot look at a single element of a university in isolation from the rest of the university. Uh, again, I'm, look, I'm focusing on students, um, absolutely, but um, I will try and touch on other things that were going on at the university at the time, just to try and give the fullest picture possible, um, so I'm uh, not ignoring anything that's of, uh, that's of importance. Um, so yes, uh, I'd also like to quickly thank the Cadbury Research Library for their support in uh, bringing this together, because obviously this is my dissertation project, so quite an important piece of work. Um, yes, I hope you enjoy. Uh, I also apologise if my... Uh, 
my knowledge isn't entirely up to scratch. Um, unlike, uh, unlike, um, uh, I've forgotten her name now. Unlike the um, the lady who Ruth was talking about earlier, I have zero letters after my name, so, <laughs> so do forgive. But I'm hoping to change that in the summer. Right. Okay, so um, just to give you a bit of background to how the events came about then, um, I'll just give you a little bit of a timeline. So my main focus of my dissertation is sort of two elements. The first is why the events came about and why there was such a scale to them. And the second element is whether they were actually successful. So let's go right back to the beginning. October 1964, Harold Wilson's Labour Party um, won the, uh, the general election. This obviously seems, seems, uh, this obviously seems um, slightly uh, abstract because it's nothing to do to, with the university really, but I'll mention later on why I think this is important. Um, 1955, 1965 to 1968, there was a wave of occupational protests that took place across the entire country, um, beginning in NSE. So again, these events that I'm talking about today at Birmingham, they did not happen in isolation. This was not something unique to Birmingham. Birmingham was part of a much wider um, movement. In June 1966, Anthony Clark, um, president of the Guild of Students, began writing um, the student role through a commission of students. This, began, this was two years before these events that this document first came about. This was two years of work from, uh, from the Guild's part. Um, February 1968 was completed and given to the university for their consideration. In June 1968, um, three student representatives on the um, university's refectory committee submitted their resignation in response to um, uh, a paper that they had submitted, a report that they had submitted, saying that there was not enough student representation on this particular committee. One of the, um, one of the students who was involved in this was a, uh, a man named Ray Phillips, who would later become the president of the Guild of Students uh, in the summer of 1968. Um, again, this is a central element, and I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail later on. Another event that took place in the summer was Sir Robert Aitken, who was vice chancellor of the university, uh, left, and he was replaced by um, another Robert, this time Robert Brocky Hunter. Um, and this was in the summer of 1968. In October, um, the Guild Executive, now led by Ray Phillips, called a, vote the, uh, called a vote of confidence in themselves at a general meeting of 1,100 students. This is significant because until this time, no executive had ever called a meeting to, um, of students to say, you have confidence in us to carry out particular proposals. This was quite controversial at the time, therefore, and it sparked a lot of interest, and that is why the, there were so many um, students who attended this meeting, 1,100. Just to give you a little bit of, idea, of an idea again, at the annual general meeting of this year, 1968, there were 83 attendees. This one had 1,100, and it gets better. <laughs> um, and then on the 20th of November, there was another general meeting called, which issued an ultimatum to the university over the student role. If they did not reach a decision by the, 20, by the 27th of November, there would be direct action in the words of the students. So this brings us to the 27th of November then. Um, university council refused to accept the student role in total. So by this I mean that they accepted some of the proposals, but not all of them, and this is what triggered the events thereafter. Uh, there was a meeting of Guild Council on the same day, which is the sort of the, the senior governing body of the Guild of Students, um, and sort of uh, um, oversees its, its, uh, its general management. And there was a general meeting uh, on the same day, which confirmed the, um, the call for direct action in response to the university's response to the student role. Um, and meanwhile, while this was going on, a group of students who referred themselves as the ad hoc group for university reform uh, marched over to the, to the Great Hall and began this occupation. The general meeting, after agreeing that, um, that direct action was the, the route that they were going to follow, went over and met them, uh, and met them there, and this began what, what, I, what I will now be referring to as the occupation. Um, just a little side note. This occupation, when it began, they, they only expected it to last 24 hours. It was only ever meant to last 24 hours. And they never expected a thousand students to get involved in it. So it did kind of spiral out of control, which again, I think is quite important as to understand us now with the, um, with the benefit of hindsight, why this happened, why this came about. So just to sort of finish up, um, 27th of November 1968 to the 5th of December, this is when the occupation took place. As I mentioned before, it peaked at 2,000 students being involved. That's a third of the entire population of the university. Um, on the 3rd of December, a general meeting of 4,000 students voted to end the occupation 
This decision was overturned by Guild Council, which is a committee of 140 odd students at the time, um, which, and they had the constitutional power to do this. Um, but I'll talk to you a little bit later on again why I think that's significant. And then on the 5th of December, December, the largest general meeting in the Guild of Students' history, 44,500 students finally voted to end the occupation. And I'm not sure if you can see this picture, but that is a panorama shot of the meeting which was held. Um, it was hosted outside the library because um, they couldn't find a room big enough to, co <laughs> to accommodate that many people, as you can probably imagine. Um, but yeah, so it, it was a very significant event in the university's history. So, why, why did it come about? Why did this occupation happen? As I mentioned before, there was a group of students who referred to themselves as the ad hoc group for university reform. Um, now, I've, uh, I've divided these, re um, these reasons up into sort of the minor reasons and the major reasons. So I'm just going to begin with the more minor reasons. These are significant reasons still, but they're not the fundamental underpinning reasons that brought about the occupation in my view. So this ad hoc group for university reform, um, during the 1960s, both wider in society, both more widely in society and on this particular campus, there was sort of a, a radicalization of politics and there was sort of a, um, a bit of a shift to the left. There was uh, uh, the concept of the new left came about and um, a lot of students were beginning to read um, about uh, political theories and a lot of these theories were sort of shifted to the left. Um, and there was therefore a lot of... Um, uh, there, was a, there were a number of calls for university reform more, more broadly. And the ad hoc group for university reform um, were a group of students who, um, who demanded for the university to uh, completely reform. They wanted to scrap university council, and they wanted, um, uh, which is the most senior governing body of the university. Uh, and they wanted, you know, um, they wanted students to effectively have far more control over, um, over the university and how it was managed. Um, they're important, obviously, because they triggered the university, uh, they triggered the occupation, but they're also important because they, they demonstrate that um, because this group, they were quite a small group, but they held a lot of influence, um, they were instrumental in getting moderate students to shift away from the centre and more towards um, more radical politics and getting involved in, student, uh, in, 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 the, um, in, in the occupation. Um, one member who, um, of the group who sort of helped them come along quite a bit was a man who was, who was called Dick Atkinson. Who had, um, he was a professor, or no, he wasn't. He was a junior yeah. junior lecturer. Yeah. No, not a professor at all. Uh, yeah, he was a junior lecturer in sociology at the university, and he had joined in 1968, I believe, and he had come from LSE. He had been a postgraduate <laughs> at LSE and had been heavily involved in the events there, and he was seemingly, from what I've read, determined to bring about the same sort of large-scale action that had appeared at LSE. So that's the first thing that's quite important. Um, the second thing is that there was a young university administration and a, very, and a veteran guild administration. Which, and ordinarily, it's the other way around. Um, so in 1968, um, Robert Aitken left and Robert Hunter arrived at the university. In the, in, since 1966, the university had also had a new registrar, a new secretary, and a, there was another position that was new as well, I can't remember which. So the senior um, directorship of the university was very young, very, very inexperienced, and still bedding itself around this new vice chancellor. Meanwhile, on the Guild side of things, Ray Phillips, who's pictured, pardon me, um, Ray Phillips had been on the Guild executive for, for three years. He was now in his third year, and he was um, very experienced. He knew how the university operated, and he therefore had the upper hand. And the final issue was the refectory affair. As I mentioned before, three students, one of whom was Ray Phillips, um, resigned from the refectory over the, um, over the lack of representation. And um, this was crucial because it demonstrated that um, for the first time, the students were taking this issue very seriously and were willing to take quite extreme measures um, when it came to um, student representation. More importantly, because Phillips was represented on that committee and submitted his resignation, there was a crack in the relationship between him as a student leader and the leadership of the university, which, was, um, which again, I think is quite important for the events that followed. Um, I also think these pictures I've included are quite interesting, uh, particularly the one of Ray Phillips. They're both extracted from a uh, red brick newspaper. Um, Phillips is there in his, uh, um, in his ac ac academic dress, obviously, and looking very presidential and very, um, very much like a strong leader. And I think that that gives us an idea of the sort of the, um, the way that Redbrick chose to depict him and the way that students saw him um, in, 19 in the autumn of 1968. So, um, the more significant reasons were the student role document, as I mentioned before. 
Um, it called for a student representation to be put, to be, to be put on 16 uh, of the university's most senior committees, including the university council and including um, the senate, which is the most senior academic body. Um, the university's response was to accept all, um, was accept the request for, for all but three of these committees. It was willing to accept all of the students' requests with the exception of University Council, because that would require a change to the statutes and charter, which would have been a request to the Privy Council. Um, the Finance and General Purposes Committee, because they didn't feel that students, um, there was a lot of sensitive information that went through that committee, and they didn't want students to be privy to that. And finally, the, um, uh, the I can't remember what it was called now, but the committee that oversaw the buildings of the university, because it took a lot of expert knowledge, and that's something that students couldn't provide. So the reasons that the university gave were, re were reasonable, and the, um, they were generally quite willing to accept what was, at the time, a very huge change to the um, organisation and governance of the university. So that is a very significant reason, because obviously the, stu the, stu the occupation was centred around the student role, but also the university's response was not unreasonable. Se the second important reason is that this, the 1960s was a period of intense political unrest, more broadly, beyond the university's campus. Um, there were occupations taking place in, uh, across the, or internationally um, in France, America, Australia, and the UK, of course, and across the nation. There were occupations, all of, almost um, ex, um, almost without exception, about student representation, from York to LSE to Leicester, and people, students were occupying over. Um, the, the student body was very, very volatile. Um, there was one incident in, uh, I think it may have been York actually where there was an occupation of a group of students because they didn't feel the standard of their, of their food was high enough, so they chose to occupy, not to have a conversation, but to occupy. And I think this gives us a bit of an idea about um, what the student's psyche was like at the time and um, what, uh, what, um, what, and sort of the, why, why the occupation came about so, so easily and why so many people got involved. Again, at the time, there were movements such as the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament uh, and other movements which were employing uh, direct action ta tactics through large marches, and these were very highly publicised um, in the 60s. Um, so therefore, I would say, just to sort of um, wind that up slightly, that ultimately, the, way, the reason the occupation came about was not due to one single reason. It was quite a, um, an interesting, potent combination of a number of uh, events that came to a head all at once. The weakening of the university's administration in combination with a very strong um, uh, guild administration, in combination with the cultural awakening, as Ray Phillips uh, termed it himself, of the 1960s, um, in combination with the student role document being finalised in that year, all meant that we had this whirlwind of, event, uh, of, of events coming together in 1968, which led to, um, uh, which sort of triggered um, uh, the, the occupation as we saw it. So was the occupation a success or failure or somewhere in between? Um, one, this, this quote is taken from uh, the meeting of the Senate um, on, the, uh, on the day the occupation ended. Ray Phillips was invited to speak on the issue of the student role, and he said, what in fact the Guild would like to see is, um, immediately is some discussion on these particular principles. This is really what most members of the Guild feel is necessary. I think this is quite an interesting line for him to use because the occupation began because the, um, the students wanted increased representation. They, they, they wanted the university to accept the remaining three terms of um, the student role. The university refused to do this and as such the students went into occupation. But then when the occupation was coming to an end, Philip didn't demand that the three points were accepted, he demanded that uh, the talks were reopened. He simply wanted talks to reopen again. Um, and that's what happened. When the university, when, when the occupation closed, talks did reopen and they assumed almost where they were. Um, and I think this is interesting because it brings into question whether the occupation therefore was actually an, a success in, the true, in its truest form, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, in terms of big things that it, um, that it achieved then, um, 4,500 students were, um, were involved in some way, shape or form in the occupation. This, is, as, as I mentioned, is a huge, um, huge achievement, but not one of the formal aims of the, of the occupation, of course. There were 2,000 people who were directly involved in the occupation, again, a huge achievement and a huge um, historical feat. Um, and there were more than 65% of students involved, again, massive. And it, it did ultimately mean, that after the occupation, uh, once the discussions reopened, that um, the, the representation for students was established on two more committee meetings. So it wasn't, it wasn't a waste at all. Um, but the, well, there was more that came from the occupation. Um, 
confidentiality, the issue of confidentiality, which was a central, uh, another central feature of, um, of the university's response that, um, that the occupation was hoping to solve, was never resolved. So in the, in the response that the university gave to the student role, the, um, they said that they did not want students to breach confidentiality. Be, they could not, the student representatives were there as representatives and could not take away any information that they got from the committees and repeat it elsewhere. Um, and this was something that the, the, the guilds had a problem with because they felt that students should um, should be able to that they can't represent that they can't represent other students effectively without um, the communication channels between the lay student, the guild, and the university. It needed to be a complete cycle. Um, after the occupation, they never budged on this issue. And having sat on some of these committees myself, I can tell you now that it is still very very much an issue. Um, even to this day. So in that respect, the, the occupation may not have actually been very successful. Um, it also hugely divided the student body. In the, in the general meeting that voted to end the occupation on the 3rd of December, uh, there were 2,300 students of this meeting of 4,000 that said, we want this occupation to end right now. And then Guild Council turned, overturned that decision. It was hugely divisive. There's much support as there was for the occupation. It was, that of support was matched by um, opposition to the occupation. Even within the Guild Executive, the Guild Treasurer submitted his resignation because he didn't feel that the occupation was being managed effectively and too much money was being spent. The Vice President, um, the Chair of the Athletics Committee and the Union Secretary began a counter campaign trying to uh, terminate it, uh, the occupation because they didn't feel it was achieving its objectives. Meanwhile, Ray Phillips and, um, and other members were um, adamantly uh, uh, arguing that it should continue. And there was also a lot of public op opposition. These are some quotes I've included from, um, some, from the Birmingham Post and the Evening Mail. It made news across all of Birmingham, and it was a huge event for the city, not just the university. Um, and I think some of these quotes sort of give an idea of um, how it was being perceived and, and some of the further implications as a result of the occupation. So um, this one, the first one, I think is quite, uh, I think it's quite strongly worded at first, but um, uh, the fact that a, um, and a lay member of the public was comparing it, was comparing the students of the University of Birmingham to um, the Nazis just 20 odd years after um, the Second World War had ended, I think that was a bit strong, but it does give you an idea of the level of um, sort of anger that there was that this was taking place. Um, they were described as hairy coconuts by um, a city councillor, um, which was cheered and applauded that. Applauded that. There was being, this event was being discussed in the, the city council chambers, um, and again, that gives an idea of the profile that it managed to achieve. And it also had long-term effects, well, medium-term effects for um, the university. Um, in a, a member of staff at the university was quoted in the evening mail as saying that there was a boycott in the university, <laughs> and parents did not want their children to come to the university because of the unrest, and that is probably justified. Um, the reputation of the students was not only damaged, but the, the reputation of the university was hugely damaged. And this is a huge cost of the occupation. So briefly, um, just to finish off, um, the student role, um, on the other hand, it achieved, it achieved full me membership representation on three 13 committees and special re um, representation on the university council. Um, after the occupation, a six-month review began, which would have begun anyway, um, uh, six months into the new committees, which um, led to further improvements, further discussion, and further conversation with the Guild about how representation could be improved in the long term. Um, and the, the committees that were established, and the representation that was established in 1968 as a result of the student role, those committees still have student representation. We still have student representation on the Council, we still have student representation on the Senate, and, it, um, and today, if you spoke to any member of senior um, academic staff at the University, they would say that the student voice, the student role, is hugely appreciated and the university would not be the success that it is without it. So to conclude then, I want to go back to this quote from Ray Phillips that I had at the beginning. What happened in 1968 was unprecedented. It was a truly shattering experience, not only in Birmingham, but in higher education internationally. It was at that particular time that a number of things came together at once. Um, I spoke to Ray Phillips on the phone a couple of weeks ago as part of my study, and this was what he said to me then. And I think that this very neatly summarizes what took place um, it, was a, it was a huge event, as I've tried to illustrate, and um, it was as a result of a number of things that sort of came to a climax at once. Um, and I think that Ray's quote nicely summarises that. Um, in terms of whether the occupation was worth it, therefore, whether, whether it was successful or unsuccessful, I'd probably say that um, in terms of 
creating a historical event within the university. It was, it was certainly magni um, it certainly achieved that, and it certainly um, was a, an event of um, immense magnitude. Um, and it did help the movement that the students were trying to um, to move towards. It did help um, them in achieving their objectives. It got two. It got extra representation on two committees, but it didn't fundamentally uh, solve the problem of confidentiality. So it sort of ticked some boxes, but not others. And this came at great cost. Um, so. Well, one reason I wanted to study this was in order to inform this debate that's going on within the student movement at the moment about direct action and about the, its effectiveness. And I think that some lessons that can be learned is that direct action um, within the student movement and within universities can be effective and it can achieve aims, but it does come at a cost. And student, uh, students today and students in the future need to bear in mind when, uh, when they engage in direct action um, that, that, yes, they may achieve their aims, but at what, at what cost will that come? And I think that's an important question for um, students to think about moving forward. So I'm going to wrap up there, and thank you very much for listening.